Hello and welcome to tonight's book reading session of Preparing for the Day After. Preparing for the Day After is a picture e-book published as a photojournalistic treatise on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of the tsunami uh, by me, Malini Shankar and Walter Keller. It is a photojournalistic treatise on disaster mitigation. So in tonight's reading, we will be talking about El Nino in uh, Chapter 22, Hydrometeorological Disaster. But let us first recap what we have learned in the previous book reading session before we go on to tonight's session. Water and sanitation is central to developmental discourse. Culture sensitive food security also has evolved out of local agrometeorological conditions prevalent in an area. Livelihoods based on local agrometeorological conditions are the best means of ensuring livelihood security. Climate change adaptation, menstrual hygiene, especially for indigenous tribal women, solid waste management, universal health care access, sustainable development goals, they are all factors to be included in the development agenda. Media personnel have to be trained in reporting disaster preparedness or the lack of it at district level. Disaster is the impact of a calamity on the human landscape. This includes the impact on lives, livelihoods, livestock and landscape. Tonight we will start with the subchapter on El Nino in chapter 20. But climate change is not a watershed event like the Asian tsunami for instance. Unless we have a huge super volcano which has a global impact and can lead to an ice age overnight. The Anthropocene version of climate change is triggered by anthropogenic factors like industrial pollution and unsustainable human development far in excess of other natural geological causes and cycles. Climate change manifests as an increase in the intensity of extreme weather events. So you have more frequent avalanches, blizzards in colder areas, more precipitation, more and intense cyclones, cloud bursts, coastal incursion, desertification, droughts, epidemic, flash flood, flood, famine, fog, few forest fires, global warming, hailstorms, mudslides, landslides, storms, sea level rise and iceberg melt, triggered tsunamis, urban floods and so on. Each of these extreme weather events can have colossal impact on human community. The consequences include food and livelihood insecurity, lack of shelter causing more imbalanced fiscal growth, skewed fiscals include impaired tax regimes, impact on public health like COVID-19 has shown us, impact on international trade and commerce, tax, aviation, shipping, public health, human development and so on. Today let me read to you about El Nino. Nowhere else on the planet is the impact of El Nino more dramatic than on the west coast of South America. Here the coast is battered by the southern or the reverse oscillation of the cold Humboldt current once every few years. What is the big deal about a cold current hugging the coast, one might ask. The reverse course of the southern oscillation wrecks havoc on the weather around the whole world with the cause with the cause by and large remaining the same but the consequences in reaction varying in response to the microclimate or the regional climate. This phenomenon is called El Nino Southern Oscillation. Let me put it more succinct. In the southern hemisphere, currents course anti-clockwise motion. That means it goes through like this instead of like this. So when uh, in once every few years, uh, this anti-clockwise motion becomes clockwise motion. That creates havoc on microclimate, seasonal weather in every lat long part of the world. Or if you calibrate a latitude against a lat longitude, that microclimate is uh, suffers a reversal in weather, weather cycle or unseasonal weather in that particular area or microclimate. And then you have a, a devastating impact on everything like fish, ocean current, monsoonal winds, trade winds and then it goes on to impact obviously agriculture, aviation, sericulture, horticulture, the food production, food security, economy, tax, trade and so on. So that's why El Nino is such a fear phenomenon especially in the agriculture economies and agricultural the belt or the tropical belt of planet earth. When this normal course of the cold car ocean current is disturbed by a geological cycle rendering its course in a clockwise oscillation it is also referred to as El Nino reverse oscillation but that's only in colloquial terms. It is not in the normal course of events for the warm equatorial current to lash the west coast of South America. Imagine the west coast of South America, Peru, Chile, etc. For the cold current, the Humboldt current normally spins off the southern ocean and heads north in an anti-clockwise motion traversing the west coast of South America to hit the point where it touches the equator and turns left traveling west just below the equator, eventually turning left again around Polynesia and coursing past the northeast coast of Australia. 
another branch of this current breaks off at the equator head to head towards New Zealand and Polynesia till it touches the center of Australia's coast and then continues its southern and then northern journey, northern journey till it circumvents the north coast of North New Zealand and surges across the South Pacific Ocean to join the cold Humboldt current again again past the pacific rise in the south pacific ocean but once every few years this current changes course from its normal anti-clockwise course to clockwise course and the, instead of starting its journey from the southeast of the south pacific ocean this cold humboldt current turns west to start its journey in the reverse direction this is the concept of reverse oscillation or southern oscillation something that scientists and geologists and oceanographers have not clearly yet understood why as of today we only know that it is a geological cycle characterized by cyclical occurrence we are yet to understand the periodicity of enso or the el nino southern oscillation historians and archaeologists need to lend credence to research climate change and el nino patterns when during the normal course the humboldt current cold current surges up the west coast of south america from the southern ocean the cold winds brought by the cold current uh, then touches the arid desert regions of southern peru during the reverse oscillation if a warm current turns down from the equator along the west coast of south america rains follow often resulting in floods destroying crops and crop land in northern peru but drought in the southern highlands squeezing the people in the coastal belt of peru as well as in the interior hinterland where indigenous people cohabit the amazon forests of peru lives livestock livelihoods are all impaired not to forget the impact on wildlife why is this geophysical cycle disturbed once every few years and what makes the cold currents change course is a question that bears critical significance thanks to its repercussions on global weather systems agriculture fisheries natural history behavior migration breeding of wildlife human livelihoods food security and global economy besides shipping aviation commerce etc during the normal anti clockwise motion of the Humboldt current, fish, biodiversity, agricultural produce are all synchronized to the prevalent weather cycle. When this is disrupted because that what, what was meant to be the passage of a warm current is rendered a cold current, naturally fish kills occur, microclimate is altered drastically along the west coast of Latin America. This has alternate repercussions on every lat long grid in the world. El Nino events are followed by La Nina. That means La Nina and El Nino are in, in interchangeable or they're they're cyclical one after the other. When the disturbed weather systems in a way fall back in place, that means La Nina brings it back in place. But La Nina periods lasting up to four years continuously after an El Nino southern oscillation have been marked with high rainfall and extreme weather events like droughts, desertification, floods and flash floods. Logically, floods follow periods of high humidity and atmospheric warmth. Periods of cold dry, periods of cold dries up the humidity leading to a rainfall deficit causing drought and desertification. If environmental factors can oscillate weather patterns, intelligent human beings must be able to respond to migrate, mitigate factors that exacerbate extreme weather which cause hydrometeorological disasters. El Nino periods are marked by extreme weather events. This is not a cosmic curse but follows logical patterns of geological cycles. High humidity brought on by warm ocean currents cause high rainfall. Humidity creates dry arid weather in subtropical climates shielded by geomorphological features causing drought. That possibly explains why drought in the Indian subcontinent was followed by unseasonal flooding in October 2009. In the flash floods of October 2009 and chronic drought or unseasonal weather in 2015, there we have seen imp impact of this dry weather on Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra, Karnataka, Kerala and Delhi claiming 300 lives. For example, warm equatorial currents off the coast of Peru cause heavy, heavy, cause heavy floods in northern Peru but drought in southern highlands of Peru. Simultaneously, there are droughts in eastern Brazil and Venezuela on the eastern seaboard of South America, alluding to the significance of geomorphology of the continent. We also need to understand periods of La Nina, for if they occur for periods of four years consecutively after a one-year El Nino occurrence, we should logically have 25 El Nino events in a, con in a century. However, we have records of only two El Nino events for the 20th century since the records began, 1982-83 and 97-98. El Nino event of the 1982 El Nino event was marked by severe floods and was followed by four years of severe drought in the Indian Ocean Rim countries causing chronic famine and starvation in Ethiopia, Sudan and Uganda. 
It is indeed amazing that a reverse oscillation of an ocean current in the South Pacific Ocean can have such consequences across the sea in countries that do not even have winds from the Pacific Rim. But that is the impact of ocean currents on westerlies, weather patterns and life cycles. The Gulf Stream, a warm ocean current taking birth in the equatorial region of North Atlantic Ocean, traverses in a clockwise fashion, uh, circling off the coast of Florida and pummeling across North Atlantic in an oblique route to the central part of North Atlantic Ocean, where the current broadens and star starts a straight course to the right, heading towards southwest of Spain, Portugal, as well as touching the northwest coast of France, southern England, and branching off west towards the southern southeast coast of Iceland. This accounts for the relatively mild weather in north of france netherlands and northwestern germany now i'm going to read a box item which i've picked up it is reproduced here from the book the world around us a reader's digest publication of 1974 nowhere is the effect of ocean currents more dramatic than along the coast of peru land of the storied incas peru whose boundary touches the equator might be expected to be lush tropical country like its northern neighbors ecuador and colombia but in reality the coastal plain of peru is a thousand two hundred mile or the th 1920 kilometer desert that is almost entirely barren paradoxically the sea alongside the desert team with life forming one of the mo one of the richest fishing grounds in the world the key to this paradox is the humboldt current moving north from frigid antarctic waters the humboldt current churns up enormous quantities of nutrients for sea life but where the current hugs the coast it traps the land between the waters and the andes mountains which form a moisture barrier to the east of northern peru the Humboldt current abruptly turns west just south of the equator. The sea and land above the turn are truly equatorial in climate, warmed by a weak southerly current, El Nino. For reasons that scientists do not yet fully understand, the Humboldt current sometimes starts its turn farther down the south, permitting El Nino to flow farther south than and suddenly the desert comes to life. For months on end, the Peruvian coastal plain receives no measurable rainfall. Some moisture is provided by a heavy mist, the Garua, and that rolls in from the sea. When the mist is thickest from May to September, it revives it revives patches of cactus moss and lichens here and there in the desert but it is el nino a name derived from the happy coming of the cry child that changes the desert most dramatically around christmas el nino moves further down the coast as the humboldt's current swings westward with el nino's warm water comes rain seeds that have lain dormant throughout the hot dry months spring to life in a miracle of growth and color some desert farmers can even grow crops of fine cotton when el nino favors them Two or three times in a century, El Nino pushes several hundred miles down the coast beyond its normal limit. Marine life accustomed to the Humboldt current's cold water dies in enormous quantities, bringing starvation to millions of birds. Ashore, floods raise over the ground before the vegetation catches hold. In ancient times, the Incas tamed these current-borne vagaries of climate with an extensive irrigation system, but today the land lies at the mercy of the sea. There are a few high points in this bauxite. Ocean currents enrich the ocean with nutrients that sustain on the microclimate of the region the cold humboldt current does, does not usher in rain or rainy season like the warm cyclones and the warm current unusual current course kills fish in large numbers this starves bird populations which in turn can affect their migration and breeding pattern according to the national oceanographic and atmospheric administration the link of which is going to be put up here as well as in the description box below what is el nino El Nino is characterized by unusually warm ocean currents or temperatures in the equatorial Pacific as opposed to La Nina, which characterized by unusually cold ocean temperatures in the equatorial Pacific. El Nino is an oscillation of the ocean atmosphere system in the tropical Pacific, having important consequences for weather around the globe. Among these consequences are increased rainfall across the southern tire of the U.S. and in Peru, which has caused destructive flooding and drought in the western Pacific, sometimes associated with devastating brush fires, bushfires in Australia. Observations of conditions in the tropical Pacific are considered essential for the prediction of a short term, a few months to maybe one year climate variation to provide necessary data 
NOA, that, that, that is the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration of the Federal Government of the United States, operates a network of buoys which measure temperature, currents, and winds in the equatorial belt. These buoys daily transmit data which are available to researchers and forecasters around the world in real time. The sea surface temperature is about 8 degrees centigrade higher in the west with cool temperatures of South America due to an upwelling of cold water from deeper levels. This cold water is nutrient rich supporting high levels of of primary productivity, diverse marine ecosystems, and major fisheries. Rainfall is around. Rainfall is found in rising air over the warmest water, and the East Pacific is rel relatively dry. The observations at 11 degrees west left diagram of 11 degrees west conditions show that the cool water below 17 degrees Celsius, the black band in these plots is within 50 meters of the surface. In normal, in non-El Nino conditions, top panel of schematic diagram the Trade winds blow towards the west across the tropical Pacific. These winds pile up a warm surface water in the West Pacific so that the sea surface is about half meter higher at Indonesia than at Equator. Sorry, at Ecuador. During El Nino, that is a bottom panel of the schematic drawing. I don't the trade winds relax in the central and western Pacific, leading to a depression of the thermocline in the eastern Pacific and an, and an elevation of the of the thermocline in the west. The observations at 11 degrees west show, for example, that during 1982, the 17-degree isotherm dropped to about 150 meters depth. This reduced the efficiency of, of upwelling to cool the surface and cut off the supply of nutrient-rich thermocline water to the euphotic zone. The, surf, the result was a rise in sea surface temperature and a drastic decline in primary productivity, the latter of which adversely affected higher tropic levels of trophic levels of the food chain including commercial fisheries in this region. The weakening of easterly trade winds during El Nino is evident in this figure as well. This is all from the, the book Reader's Digest book. I'm not sure. I'm not, I did not get permission to use it. Rainfall follows the warm water eastward with associated flooding in Peru and drought in Indonesia and Australia. The eastward displacement of the atmospheric heat source overlaying the warmest water results in large changes in the global atmospheric circulation, which in turn force changes in weather in regions far removed from the tropical Pacific. Recognizing an El Nino, El Nino can be seen in sea surface temperature in the equatorial Pacific Ocean. El Nino can be seen in measurements of the sea surface temperature such as those shown above, that is in the book again, made from TO, TAO array of moored boys. In December 1993, the sea surface temperatures and the winds were near normal, with warm water in the western Pacific Ocean in red on top of the panel of the December 1990 plot and the cool water called the cold tongue in the eastern Pacific region in green on the top panel of the December 1993 plot. The El Nino events are followed by La Nina, a period of excessive rain caused by largely by the unusual warm currents during El Nino. It's a cause and consequence pattern. December 1998 was a strong La Nina or a cold event. Cold tongue is cooler than usual by about 3 degrees centigrade. The cold La Nina events sometimes but not always follow El Nino events. That is because when El Nino is it's, it's warm and dry, if it is humid and moist, there is every reason to trigger moisture and moisture laden clouds come down as rain. But El Nino is dry and hot. So, it has to be warm and moist for monsoons to be triggered. See, in simple terms, that's what it is. Normal equatorial Pacific Ocean surface temperatures are shown in the middle pattern, including cool water called the cold tongue in the eastern Pacific, that is in blue on the right side of the plot, and warm waters in the western Pacific in red on the left. Strong La Nina conditions during December 1998 are shown in the top panel. These, are all, these pictures are not there. I don't have permission to use those pictures. The eastern Pacific is cooler than usual and the cold water extends farther westward than is usual. The blue color extending further to the left. Strong El Nino conditions in December 1997 are shown on the bottom panel with warm water red extending all the all along the equator. El Nino and La Nina are opposite phases, phases of the El Nino southern oscillation. With La Nina sometimes being referred to as the cold phase of Enzo and El Nino as the warm phase of Enzo. During the El Nino in 1986-87 you could see the warm water penetrating eastward in the spring of 1987. There is another El Nino in 1991-92 and you can see the warm water penetrating towards the east in the 
the northern hemisphere of spring of 1990. The 1997 to 1998 El Nino was unusually strong. El Nino and La Nina years are easier to see in the anomalies on the right hand panel. The anomalies show how much the sea surface temperature is different from the usual value for each month. Water temperatures significantly warmer than the norm are shown in red and water temperatures cooler than the norm are shown in blue. That is all this in the NOAA website. I think. In the right hand plot of the sea surface temperature anomalies it is very easy to see El Nino with warm water than usually, that is in the red in the eastern Pacific, such as 1986, 87, 91, 92, 93, 94, and 97, 98. It is unusual for El Ninos to occur in such rapid succession as was the case during 90 to 94. It is said, I'll come to that later, it is said that it is volcanoes, submarine volcanoes and sea mounts that erupt under the sea and trigger El Nino. That so sounds quite like. Notice the very cool water in the eastern Pacific in 1988-89 and the somewhat less cool water in 1995 following El Nino events. These are La Nina events which occur after some time but not always after every El Nino. Typically El Nino occurs more frequently than La Nina. A list of El Nino and La Nina years provided by the National Center for Environmental Prediction. El Nino and La Nina events vary in strength. For example, the La Nina in 1988 was stronger than the La Nina in 1995 and 1997-98 El Nino was unusually strong. I remember I was in Germany and the winter was washed out. There was no snow. I will put up a link here and on this NOAA link, you may get many answers to a lot of frequently asked questions then that cannot only satiate one's curiosity, but also can offer an informative guide to questions on weather phenomenon associated with El Nino event. Hence, we can see that weather patterns alternate in uh, alternate latitude and longitudinal grids across the globe. During the 1997-98 El Nino event, winter was washed out in continental Europe. Uh, with an unusually warm winter. This was followed by un unseasonal hail in spring of 1998 and unseasonal rain and floods in spring of 1999 in continental Europe. El Nino in southern or El Nino and the ENSO is a mode of tropical climate variability arising from interaction between the atmosphere and the tropical ocean. Associated with this phenomenon, several atmospheric and ocean oceanic parameters oscillate in unison with a quasi-periodicity of about four years. In one phase, the eastern equatorial Pacific is unusually warm, while in the opposite phase, it is unusually cold. These fluctuations in the tropical Pacific has large climatic impact in many parts of the globe, such as droughts in Indonesia, India, floods in some parts of USA etc. When there is a drought in India, Sri Lanka is unusually pounded with floods caused by unseasonal rain. Over India on an average sense, an El Nino is associated with below normal rainfall while a La Nina that is the opposite of El Nino is associated with above normal rainfall. However, this relationship is not strong. While many El Ninos are associated with drought over India, there are many droughts that are not associated with El Ninos at all. Similarly, the strongest El Nino of the century in 1997 did not have any effect on the monsoon rainfall. In 1997, monsoon rainfall was close to long-term average. There are also different shades of El Nino. The one with the largest sea surface temperature anomaly confined to the easternmost Pacific has less impact over Indian rainfall, while the ones with the largest sea surface temperature anomalies over the central Pacific seem to have stronger negative impact on monsoonal rain. While ENSO is a significant factor in modulating the Indian monsoon rainfall, it is not the only one. In addition to the ENSO, there are some regional drivers and internal monsoon variability that influence year-to-year -year variation of monsoon rainfall, says Dr. B. N. Goswami, Professor Emeritus Indian Institute of Tropical Medicine, in an exclusive email interview given to me for this book. Understanding El Nino and its repercussions is the most challenging task confronting disaster managers, oceanographers, agricultural scientists, climate scientists, administrative officers, activists, etc today. The media has largely understated the significance of El Nino except where it makes an impact on food prices and food inflation at least in the subcontinent. Documentation of anecdotal evidence makes for a historical database when substantiated by scientific records. This documentation is not only quintessential but is absolutely necessary. The plight of farmers in Peru, Canada, Germany, New Zealand are all very similar. The problems in Africa are exacerbated by weather vagaries and corrupt dispensation. A lot of research and documentation are required to tabulate and understand, comprehend and respond to El Nino events so that humanity can mitigate disasters emanating from El Nino. Many questions remain unanswered. More questions arise than, answer, than are answered about El Nino. 
what are the factors that trigger El Nino Southern Oscillation? Only seamounts and volcanic eruptions are under the Pacific. What mechanism in the Southern Ocean triggers this reverse oscillation? If La Nina lasts at least for four years after every El Nino, like it happened after the 1982 El Nino event, logically there should be 96 years of La Nina in a century and four years of El Nino, I think 25. So four, uh, four, 25 El Nino. Why is it why is it that there can only be two to three El Nino events per century? No, that's not true. It can't be. For example, if there are only two to three El Nino events per century, the cycle should be once every 30 to 50 years. What then were the causes that led to two El Nino events within a gap of 15 years, 1982-83 to 97-98 in the last century? Can La Nina or El Nino events and impact be mitigated with good environmental practice? It may be an anecdotal evidence, but rural folk in Goa's hinterland were suffering an extreme summer in April 1971. Elders kept saying that they had not seen such harsh summer in 60 years. In June as well as in November of 1971, three fierce cyclonic storms hit then East Pakistan, already beleaguered by the independence movement for Bangladesh exacerbated political tensions with India, which was suspected to have supported Mukti Bahini. As regards to disaster mitigation on account of El Nino, humanity has miles to go before we multidisciplinary research is needed. For instance, to tabulate extreme events and their impact on the society, economy, trade, agriculture, traditions, polity, policy, etc. In today's day and age, with all the tools that the internet affords us, it helps to pool intellectual capital for collective growth, especially in reference to climate change induced or other hydrometeorological and natural calamities. There is a dire need to study and document many extreme weather events. It follows the need for better understanding of the atmospheric cycles and sciences of planet Earth, so that the toiling millions are more resilient. We need to establish the following to be better prepared for the impact of El Nino, El Nino and La Nina. Country-wise impact of El Nino on agriculture, country-wise impact of El Nino on weather-centric livelihoods, country-wise tabulation of droughts, El Nino, impact of El Nino on fisheries, tabulation of all forms of extreme weather, tabulation of El Nino on livelihoods, com a comprehensive list, a tabulation of floods, tabulation of record of El Nino events and, la and local impacts, a database of cyclones in the Arabian Sea, a database of cyclones in Bay of Bengal, a database of cyclones in the Indian Ocean, hurricanes in the Atlantic Ocean, seasonal and unseasonal migration of wildlife, a database of typhoons in the Pacific Ocean, Latitude-wise tabulation of impact of El Nino on monsoons, lat-long tabulation of impact of El Nino on microclimate, Long longitude-wise tabulation of farm produce during the El Nino events, longitude-wise tabulation of fish cast during the El Nino events, record of tsunamis caused by earthquakes, a record of tsunamis caused by volcanic eruptions, record of tsunamis caused by landslides, uh, icebergs and meteor hits, tabulation of early warning from wildlife behavior, tabulation of maelstroms, and currents, an exhaustive and rigorous tabulation of the above list enlisted data can only start to show a pattern. So uh, we have long uh, miles to go before we can sleep and that is all for tonight. We have finished the subchapter on El Nino and impact. In the next week's reading, I will read about floods, flash floods and urban floods. Until then, take care, stay home, stay safe and keep smiling. Ciao.